the BLM movement has been dominating the news in the streets recently. And while this movement has been sparked by the murder of George Floyd, whose um, murder, um, his, whose memory we, we honor, it was not just one incident of murder that poured all this anger into the streets all over the world, right? It was an expression of centuries of oppression the Black people have endured and continue to endure under the system. Racism has a long history um, under you, the, both the U.S. and Canada, and it's an organic feature of capitalism. That's why it permeates every aspect of life. When we talk about racism, we're not just talking about the police force, um, which has been statistically proven to be an inherently racist institution. Uh, just to kind of go over those stats, in the States, over a thousand unarmed civilians are shot by the police each year. And black men are three times more likely to die at the hands of the police than white men are. Here in Toronto, where black people make up 8.3% of the population, they make up 36.5% percent of all the fatalities. Uh, indigenous people make up 15% of people killed by the police when they make up 4.8 of the overall Canadian population. Um, so there's, there's no doubt here that the police, first of all, targets racial minorities, but also, like I said, racism isn't exclusive to the police. Uh, you can find these racial disparities in the COVID um, infection and death rates. And, it, and it's interesting, I think that's an interesting example because the pandemic, the one we have today is a newer phenomena in society, but you could still see systemic racism express itself there, um, how deeply entrenched it is in the system we live in today. Uh, in the US, black people have been dying at more than double the rate of white people from coronavirus. And that's just the national average. If you, if you go in specific areas, um, the, the, these numbers are even higher. In D.C., for example, Black people are five times more likely to die from the virus. In Michigan and Missouri, they're six times more likely to die from the, di from the virus. And in Kansas and Wisconsin, the figure stands at seven times more. In Toronto, during the first wave, Black people, and to reiterate, they make 8.3% of Toronto's population. They carried 21% of all COVID cases. 17% uh, of the cases were carried by white people although they make up 48% of Toronto's population. And it's been reported a few days ago, actually, I was looking at the news, that uh, racialized low-income neighborhoods are now getting over 10% of all COVID cases. And it's only getting worse from here as the second wave washes over. Uh, these stats, all of them, they prove that systemic, that racism is very systemic. It's a very real material thing. And I'm sure most people here would agree with that although neither one of the presidential candidates in the states do. Uh, when asked if systemic racism was real during the debate, Trump flat out denied, and Biden said that, yeah, maybe there's racial insensitivities. This calls into question a close examination of what systemic racism actually is. Clarity is essential when we're looking at problems like these, because without a clear understanding, we won't have any solutions. And, and that's what I'm going to be trying to break down for tonight. And it goes without saying that as Marxists, we stand against all forms of oppression. An injury to one is an injury to all. And there can be no liberation without fighting against all forms of oppression. We seek to unite workers of all skin colors, all religions, genders, ethnic minorities, and any type of divisions that the ruling class instills in us. Um, however, I'm not going to be starting with the Marxist understanding of racism. I'm actually going to be picking out the incorrect conceptions of racism, principally those academic ideas that are characterized by their postmodernist, pessimistic, narrow-minded approach. These ideas have gained traction recently, uh, specifically in the universities, and many are presented as very radical and sometimes even Marxist. And it's, it's vital for us to break down and see where Marxism actually stands in relation to these ideas so that we can avoid the confusion and have a clear understanding of what the Marxist view actually is. Um, I'll be specifically tackling identity politics, but if you want to learn more about what postmodernism is and comparison between it and Marxism, we had an event on that two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, my comrade Olive did a great job at it, um, and the live stream is up on our Facebook page. 
generally speaking, there's a tendency when examining social issues and phenomena to kind of isolate them and atomize them as separate systems uh, existing outside of the material conditions that we have today, and especially outside of the economic relations under capitalism. Um, in the case of racism, we, they claim that the root can be found in the system of white supremacy, right? White supremacy creates racism. And this may sound radical, but at the core of it, this is idealism, right? You explain the existence of ideas by pointing at other ideas. And this postmodernist approach has had impact, uh, especially among students in the West. And honest people really grab onto these ideas because they see occurrences of racial in inequality and they feel this burning sense of urgency around them because they see nothing being done. And these issues, these ideas uh, around these issues are being promoted in universities and by many different uh, leaders. It's primarily students and those on university campuses that are drawn to these ideas because it's there that these ideas are generated, right? The ivory towers of um, academia, completely detached from the conditions of the general working population. The funny thing about these ideas though, is that these thinkers themselves are not consistent with what they put forward, right? Like what, what is white supremacy? What is whiteness? You have entire research departments that write on these things, but there's yet to find a consistent scientific definition of these terminologies. Uh, an example of this would be American author Robin D'Angelo, who is a critical race theorist. Um, she talks about these notions of like white supremacy and whiteness and so on in her best-selling book, White Fragility. Uh, I'm sure most people here have heard about it or seen it around. Uh, the book sold out. Uh, she actually starts off with a materialist perspective. Uh, she's trying to debunk the understanding that race has a biolog is a biological distinction, right? The earliest race theories base themselves in biology and science. Uh, she says, the idea of racial inferiority was created to justify unequal treatment. First, people were exploited for resources. Then came the idea of racial inferiority to justify the exploitation. And, and this is a materialist, actually correct understanding, right? That there was a material necessity, exploiting resources, that led to the rise of ideology, which is like racial inferiority. Um, but she goes on to contradict herself and say, the system of racism begins with ideology. And this is wrong for many reasons. Um, to say that racism begins with ideology you are reducing oppression that has real historical material basis, just an idea, right? And, and, and that's classic for the postmodernists. Uh, instead of finding the root of oppression in class society, the root is in ideology. It's in our social behavior, in, in the discriminatory language that, that, that can be used. What's the conclusion that you would approach, that you would conclude, like, what is the conclusion you would arrive to out of an approach like this? If it's simply a matter of ideas, oppression then can be solved by changing our individual behaviors in our language, right? And this is so convenient for liberal politicians who refuse to take any concrete action, but instead they adopt this progressive woke language to make it seem like they're doing something um, when they're actually not. Um, and this approach not only gives this kind of justification. It also minimizes the depth of racism, right? If you believe um, that it's just a matter of ideas, then you begin to believe that it could be remedied by superficial changes, right? Representation, uh, choice of language, increasing diversity. You know, they say things like, oh, like if we, if we just get more black women in the police force, it would become a more humane institution. Uh, RCMP, they need to give land acknowledgements before they break up the indigenous protest days. Uh, if you're signing court orders to imprison black folks, make sure you capitalize the B and, you know, throw in that gender neutral X that they sprinkle on anything like parsley. Um, and, and I say this ironically, but like the, this is what these theorists actually put forward. Like D'Angelo says, um, we need psychological freedom from race because that's our priority, 
as racialized working people is that we want to be granted psychological freedom, not material freedom. That's not our priority. Our priority is not full access to health care, um, to free health care, full access to employment and decent wages, full access to socialized housing, community security and services instead of police brutality and prison labor. That's, that's not the material freedom we want. We actually want psychological freedom, right? And it's, it's quite laughable what they propose to combat racism, but it's, it's very fitting for the state of intellect under declining capitalism. In her last chapter, um, it's titled, Where Do We Go From Here?, she sums up the entirety of her book, and she just says that racism cannot be avoided, right? She says that in good faith, obviously, so that, like, you know, fellow white people can continue their learning pro process to unpack their white guilt, white fragility, white tears, white victimhood, you know, the, the list of the words that they use. Um, and, it, and it's important to, to, you know, promote these notions and normalize them because there's material interest behind it. If you tell white people that, you know, they have privilege and it's inevitable, um, you could profit off of that. Now look at this woman. Right? She made millions of dollars writing this book for other white liberals to buy and read it as their own form of activism. And it's literally self-help literature for racism. And like that's typical for liberals and they do that regardless of race. Uh, they don't have to be white, right? Like. If you know, you know, if you're in Toronto, God knows how many panel discussions that were set up to unpack and deconstruct. And they charge people actual dollars to sit through these ideas. And I think it's quite telling where these ideas lead you to, right? There's nothing that can be done to change the conditions. So instead, we have to change how we think and just hope for the best. Maybe if we change our perception of ourselves, i.e. our identity, then we can change our interpersonal relationships. And through that, we can change our environments at work, at school, at home. And maybe then, and only then actually, we can have a society that is either void of discrimination or has little of it, right? And the conclusion derives from this is that, you know, we have to change our minds. People who experience oppression inevitably know how to fight oppression. And so they can provide us with better policies. It's like they, they, they learned nothing from the experience of Obama, our first black president, who called the National Guard on BLM protesters. And his administration deported more undocumented immigrants than the Trump administration has. It's, it's these policies, that the exact type of policies that, that when they were implemented as a result of civil rights movements in the, in the 1960s, right? You had programs and policies that focus on anti-discrimination, quotas of hiring more minorities. All of these things were encouraged by the JFK government in 1961, um, Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965. And the goal behind these programs was to encourage workplaces and schools and public institutions to be more representative of the general population, i.e., you know, represent more the, the racial minorities in society. And these were just like affirmative action hiring quotas. But what has it led to? Like, we have to ask ourselves that. Has that abolished racism in any way? It hasn't, right? All it did was partially liberate a tiny minority, Obama, uh, Oprah, or whoever you want to think of, but they leave the rest of that racial population oppressed and exploited. The reason that there is discrimination on the basis of race or gender or nationality is that there is economic inequality that, that capitalism creates. You cannot begin to address racism without addressing capitalism. And if affirmative action actually eliminated racism by any means, we wouldn't all be here today talking about this. It would have all been over decades ago. These ideas are reformist at best and reactionary at worst. Um, a devastating reality is that they are actually adopted by labor and union leaders who uh, seem, they use them to seem radical when in reality, all they're doing is advance their own careers and they're unwilling to let the movement go forward. A recent example that comes to mind is actually the leadership of the Canadian Federation of Students. Um, very recently, they held a strike, which was far from 
Um, it was simply a series of online academic posters where they put these ideas forward. And not only did they not mention the fact, uh, the fight against capitalism, they said that this is not even the space to bring it up. Um, any criticism or any class-based perspective being raised was shut down because it was silencing, devaluing, minimizing um, from the experiences of these racialized executives. And uh, you can see here how identity politics shifts from simply being useless in solving problems to actually serving as a weapon, right? It justifies inaction. And, and this is reactionary because it holds the movement back. And as Marxists, we, our, our goal is to advance the movement, right? We need to have a clear understanding of the foundations of racism, what it is, how it originated, so we can put forward a way to fight it, right? It's, it's a very real issue, so it's going to need a very real solution. So let's get into that. Um, what is racism? Um, uh, according to Marxists, Racism is an organic feature of capitalism. Malcolm X sums this up pretty nicely when he says, you can't have capitalism without racism, right? The racism that we see today did not begin with white supremacy. It did not begin with whiteness. It actually began with um, capitalism. And, and we could start with the US. You know, we could trace it all the way back to the transatlantic slave trade, right? As early as the 17th century, Black people used to work on plantation as chattel slaves and indentured servants alongside poor European indentured servants. Essentially, what indentured servitude is, it's the act of giving up a certain amount of years to a landowner in advance. Um, and then you, the, your term would be up and then you would be free, basically. Uh, and in the early years, there wasn't really much distinction between the Black and European laborers. They were just servants who just performed labor. Right. Uh, but there was vast amount of lands available at the time, uh, especially in the South. So there was a reliance on slave labor that grew. And this happened for two reasons. One of them is that slaves were the actual property of their owner. So there wasn't any period of freedom that was anticipated, as was the case with indentured servants who would just occupy a piece of land and work it for themselves once their term was up the landowners couldn't actually force them to work their lands for them. Um, and slavery provided a much more reliable source of cheap labor in that regard. The second reason um, why there was more reliance on slave labor was that slaves who were imported from the African continent had different skin color. So it was much easier to justify their exploitation and alienate them from their white counterparts. And this was very useful because tensions began to grow between the classes, right? You would have uprisings take place. Um, there are these laborers who would rebel against the plantation and landowners on a united class line. Uh, one of the most famous uprisings is Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. Amazing. Um, white indentured servants and black slaves united together against their common exploiter, and they burnt down the Virginia state capital of Jamestown. The ruling class here began to fear class unity and needed to divide the working class to weaken it, and racism played its role here. It alienated Black people from the general population and kept them in bondage, while also justifying the horrible conditions that Black people had to go through. So you could see that these artificial divisions of race were massively amplified after these events unfolded, right? Before then, slaves, serfs, and indigenous servants were looked down upon because of their position in society, not because of their race. Racial discrimination is actually a product of capital development because chattel slavery was a vital component in the primitive accumulation of capital for the capitalist class in the U.S., Racism served to divide and conquer the working class and also provided cheap disposable labor. And this divide and conquer tactic was used by the British Empire previously. So it wasn't unique to the uh, US ruling class, right? They, they, the British Empire would divide the working class on religious lines, on ethnic lines, tribal lines. And particularly because it was uh, a practice that was used, it was so easy to 
export racism as an ideology. And it was moved around from, from its American origin to the Caribbean, to South Africa, and to all around. As the US, right? If you look at Canadian capitalism, you could see that um, it developed on the same lines. The French and British ruling class used similar divide and conquer tactics against the indigenous population. They caused fratricidal wars between the fur traders to make them more dependent on them. And then they instituted racist laws to civilize them, assimilate them into bourgeois society. Anti-indigenous racism was amplified by the ruling class shortly prior to the Confederation in 1867. Um, you had actually the Northwest Mounted Police. Uh, this is what the RCMP was before joining another police force. It was actually modeled after Britain's Royal Irish Constabularies, whose role was to keep the Irish under control. And the RCMP does exactly that. It's the same role, but in relation to indigenous people. You can see that racism in all these instances, that it originated as a tool for the ruling class, right? All it did was help expand capitalism and also maintain it. Because as capitalism developed, the need to divide the oppressed remained. The abolition of slavery, granting civil rights in the 60s, none of these things change the fact that capitalism is inherently an exploitative system. So while you had these um, explicitly racist segregationist laws and policies removed, segregation remains today. Except today it's not driven by law, it's driven by economics. Right? You have disenfranchisement and poverty of racialized communities. It continues to provide cheap labors for capitalists to make profit out of it. Sometimes not cheap labor, it's actually free labor. And, and that's thanks to prisons. The United States holds less than 5% of the world's population, but the prisons in the United States holds 22% of the world's population. Most of the government's budget goes into policing, right? The NYPD's budget is actually double that of Venezuela's entire military budget. One of the reasons behind these high budgets is that prison labor is a billion dollar industry. Uh, not, uh, you have all these state owned prisons, they contract incarcerated workers to private companies. And, and this is not even to mention the private prisons who just like love to put their head into the market whenever they find any like um, laws or legislations that increase arrests or increase um, longer sentences for inks. And when you look at this incarcerated population, 50, 53% of all incarcerated people are in prisons for nonviolent crimes. So crimes like petty theft, shoplifting, multiple speeding uh, um, tickets, sex work, things like that. And, and it's no wonder that police targets racialized groups because they're predominantly working class. They're disenfranchised and they're stuck in poverty. How does the ruling class justify all of this? How do they justify this um, harsh the, the police targeting and, and these prison, large prison population? They tell you things like, oh, black people are violent. Right? They tell you that it's black on black crime. They tell you that like, oh, indigenous people are lazy. Their communities are filled with drugs and alcohol. Racism justifies this. So racism is not a system that begins with ideology, as D'Angelo claims. It's in fact the system that is racist. When we're talking about systemic racism, we're in fact talking about the racism of the capitalist system. We're not talking about whiteness. We're not talking about white supremacy. We have to call it what it is. When conflating white supremacy with capitalism, you shift the focus onto individuals Instead, it's on the system, and you completely absolve the ruling class from its responsibility and the blood that it has on its hands. The reality is that capitalism oppresses and exploits the working class as a whole, and racialized working people experience systemic racism on top of that, and it provides a cheaper pool of labor for the capitalists. And it also serves to prevent them from linking up with the white workers who are also uh, being exploited by the capitalists. So if we want to fight racism, then the logical conclusion is for us to go against its very purpose of dividing the working class. The answer to racism is in fact in class unity, right? 
any progress for racialized communities that happened in the past, if we're talking about abolition of slavery, if you're talking about the civil rights movement, if you're talking about national independence movements, all of these gains were a result of mass movements where the class was united. And we don't say this because of some sentimental, oh, love Trump's hates, let, let's all hold hands, kumbaya shit. Like, there's actually a practical reason why we need class unity. The, the working class derives its strength from, from its unity because it has a common enemy. During a labor dispute uh, where the boss is driving down wages, whether the workers unite or divide actually is a deal breaker, right? Workers of color or immigrant workers with low wages force white and domestic workers to lower their wages in order to compete. Both parties have to accept shitty conditions and the boss is the only one who benefits from this because he's the one making profits, right? So the workers have two options. One, we can play this blame game, right? Like the white, white people could be racist. They could say, okay, you dirty immigrants. You don't, like, this is my country. This is not your country. Go back to where you came from. You don't deserve higher wages, right? And, you know, the racialized workers could go like, okay, you're a fucking piece of privileged white piece of shit. And you don't deserve um, higher wages because of your privilege. And the boss continues to make money off of both of them because they're not uniting. You have the second option where they can unite on class lines. They can go on strike. They stop the boss from profiting off of the both of them. And they occupy the factory and shut production down. This cut practically across racist divisions, not just racial divisions, but gender divisions, religious lines, national lines too. During times of class struggle, prejudice begins to break down. Right now, 63% of Americans report that they support the Black Lives Matter movement today. In 2016, it was 27%. What changed? Conditions, right? We're in a crisis. Class consciousness is actually on the rise, right? Sections of the Black Lives M movement are no longer asking for anti-discriminatory training in police uh, units or more body cameras. They're not asking for reforms. Um, it's actually called, they, you find sections that are actually calling for the abolishment of the police. The police is a vital component of capitalism. What we're witnessing today with the movement in the States is the beginnings of a revolutionary movement. Yet, yes, it is on a higher level than previous movements, but if capitalism remains, then so will the conditions that we want so desperately gone. We need class methods of struggle. We need to change the system. We need to create one when there's no scarcity so people won't feel the need to turn on one another. A system where no class has power over the other, where racism loses its power, where the state and its police lose their role. That system has to be one that is able to provide for everyone, where production is run and controlled by the working class. You can't have capitalism without racism, so let capitalism run. Let's build socialism. And I'll leave it at that.